McDonald, the happiest story I know. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. This is really fun. It's also very warm in here. <laughs> Having everybody over to my house uh, to do my first special is great. Because I think either it's going to go really well, or I'm going to tank and it'll be the greatest video of a man bombing in his own home. <laughs> Just like a stand-up comedian fails in front of his own living room. Every time he comes downstairs, he remembers how bad he is at his dreams. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's on you guys to make that not happen, so... I started writing this story a couple of years ago. I went on a trip to India, and I went on a trip to go and, like, you know, like, find myself, like, spiritually or whatever, and... Here's the thing, the furthest I'd ever traveled before I went to India was one time my parents took me to North Carolina. <laughs> and you know what I learned when I got to India? North Carolina, nothing like India. Those two places are vastly different. And I'm just like very white and uncultured in every way, you know? Like I didn't have, I didn't study what India was gonna be like. I'm like, oh, I'll just show up, it'll be fine. I went to find myself and I ended up just finding myself with like no money left over. I had $30 left to my name, which is not enough. And as a career path, I've chosen to be a stand-up comedian. So, presumably, I'm never going to make money again for the rest of my life. And there's no, like, backup plan. I don't have, like, a... Sometimes I think to myself, I'm like, oh, man, if this doesn't work out, I'll be a professional wrestler. <laughs> That's plan B. <laughs> uh, I had one other dream. When I was in high school, I had another dream. I, uh, I wanted to be a rapper. I know. That is the appropriate response to that. Uh, I'll tell you guys my, my rap name. Do you guys want to hear my rap name? Yes. Yes. All right, sweet. Uh, my rap name was Ziploc because I was keeping it fresh. That's true. That's a real choice that I made. It's also like the whitest rap name that I've ever heard in my entire life. Just like G-Unit and N-W-A, and I'm like, oh, what's on the kitchen cover? <laughs> Ziploc fresh, perfect, let's do it. <laughs> so I, I just come back from India, and I've got no money and no viable career choices, and my rap and comedy career were both not taking off. <laughs> so I had to go and like, get a job that I hated for 40 hours a week. And in order to get this job, I had like this bicycle at the time, which was like my saving grace of the whole situation because uh, it means that I didn't have to take the bus, which is a gift in and of itself. I don't know if you guys have taken the bus. It's one of the worst places in the entire world. <laughs> Every time you're on the bus, it's just you and a bunch of people being like, all right, things haven't turned out the way that we planned. <laughs> Maybe if we stick together, we can get through this. <laughs> what is that smell? <laughs> Recently, I was on the bus, and I was sitting in the back, and there was this ad up on the top, and in big letters, it just said, Are you depressed? <laughs> and I was like, well, I can read, and I'm on the bus. So yeah, I'm depressed. <laughs> Honestly, I felt it was a little insulting that they had to ask. You know what I mean? They were like, all right, we need to target depressed people. Where should we go? The bus, the bus, all right. In big letters, they just say, hey, you are depressed. Come take part in our study, please. So riding this bike, and I'm not taking the bus. And it was also like the middle of winter that I got back. So I'm riding my bike, and it's just so just like brutally cold outside. Like, you know, like sometimes in the winter around February, you just walk outside and you're like, well, this is just rude. Why is it like this? Weather is being inconsiderate. Who immigrated here? Why did we make this choice? Let's all leave. We'll get on a bus. It'll be fine. So it's in the middle of this winter and I go to print off some resumes to get a job that I hate for 40 hours a week. And I go into the library and I leave my bike outside. And then when I come back outside, with my resumes in my backpack, I go to put my key in my bike and I like, push the lock and I'm 
it's like not coming unhinged from like the thing, you know? It's kind of like frozen over. So I'm just like railing on it in the middle of downtown Hamilton, just dozens of people surrounding me. And it's never like the big moments in life, you know? It's never, it's never the big things that take you over the edge. It's just like a million horrible things happen to you. And then one day your bike is locked in downtown Hamilton. You start laughing to yourself. Just, <laughs> this is fine, I'm okay. People watching you be like, this guy's obviously having a mental breakdown. <laughs> Here's the thing, this is how I know I'm not an ax murderer because of this moment. If I had the ax murderer gene inside of me, I would have started ax murdering people down the street. And it's not even like my bike is stolen. It's literally staring at me right in the face. Just all of my failures physically manifesting themselves in front of me. Just, hey, Zach, India didn't work out, huh? Oh, you're gonna have to ride the bus now. Oh, uh, comedy's not a viable financial option for you. Screw you, bicycle. How do you know all those things? So here's what I had to do. I just had to look at my bicycle and just go, well, I guess my life is terrible now. That's what that is. And I had to walk away. It was very sad. But eventually, I went and got some friends together, and the first place we decided to go to get help to get our bike back was we went to the police station. We asked them if they would help us get this bike back and just cut the lock for us. <laughs> they were like, are you asking us to steal a bike for you? Because we 100% won't do that. But I was with my friend Kevin at the time, and Kevin is a pastor at a local church, and he looked at him, he's like, but I'm a pastor. <laughs> They're like, we don't care, that doesn't count here. <laughs> it's not a real thing to us. Might as well have been like, I'm a wizard. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually what I had to do is I had to go and get a hacksaw, and I had to hacksaw my own bike for like 45 minutes in the freezing cold. Some point, some guy came up to me, he's like, hey man, is that your bike? I'm like, yeah, it's my bike. And I got the hacksaw in my hand. He's like, you know what, man, you can just have it. That is your bike, actually. <laughs> also, like, what was I gonna say? You know, like, hey man, is that your bike? No, I'm stealing it. <laughs> Hope you can't call people quickly. <laughs> so here's what I learned. You can be the most positive person in the world. You are gonna get slapped in the face by life at some point. And I think it's important to express your feelings and to talk about the struggle that you're going through and to relate to those hard times. And that's why I decided to write this show. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. I grew up in a, kind of a rough situation. My mom uh, was addicted to drugs and alcohol and my family and I, we were really poor. We had to live in people's basements and in people's attics and in welfare housing and we even lived in a car for a period of time and all of this stuff sucked. <laughs> it was not a fun time. I'm not going to recommend any of those experiences to anyone. Here's the thing. If you grow up and your parents are drug addicts, it means that you have to live the life of a drug addict without the added release of actually getting to do the drugs. <laughs> Being a drug addict is not very fun. Doing drugs is super fun. That is why drug addicts exist. <laughs> I just had to be broke and sober this whole time. I am painfully aware of how much this sucks. <laughs> I remember one story though that always sticks out to me from my childhood. And it was this one time in the fifth grade, my younger sister and I, we used to never go to school on Fridays. Because on Thursday nights, my mom would get super blackout, pass out drunk, and she wouldn't be able to wake us up for school on Friday. And one day, about halfway through the year, I decided that I was gonna make a change. So I went and I packed my backpack together and I decided that I was gonna go to school. But when I woke up, I'd already like missed the bus. So I had to try and figure out what the direction of the bus was by myself. But I was nine years old, so my navigation skills were poor at the time. <laughs> so I ended up spending two or three hours wandering the streets and I start crying until this woman picks me up and she drives me to school. I thought when I got to school, I was going to be getting with high fives and triumphant Elton John music was going to play in the background. The rest of the students were just going to hoist me up on their shoulders for some reason. But that's not what happened. What happened 
So my teacher looked at me and she's like, oh, look, it's Zach, finally here on a Friday. Which was a rude thing to say to a nine-year-old. <laughs> Listen, lady, I'm nine. I'm not skipping school to smoke weed in the stairwell. <laughs> Maybe there are some problems at home. <laughs> Can you give somebody a call? <laughs> I used to get these little progress reports at the end of the year and be like, Zach doesn't do a very good job of paying attention in class. It's like, well, Zach hasn't had a vegetable in seven years, all right? Why don't you cut Zach some slack, all right? Get some vitamin C in his diet, see what kind of student he is. Here's what I learned. I realized, though, that that story, it's not the story of a kid that was lost and alone and afraid. That's the story of a kid that was persistent and wasn't going to let his circumstances define the person that he became which is the person that i become. And it's why I've been able to write this show, and it's why I've been able to find humor in my situation, which is my favorite thing to do. For example, I was telling a girl recently that I used to live in a car as a kid, and she was like, oh, because you were poor? Ah, uh, yeah, because we were poor. <laughs> Living in a car is always a financial decision. <laughs> Nobody goes around, looks at a bunch of houses like, you know what, we'll just stay in the car, it's fine. <laughs> this place doesn't have automatic windows. There's no sunroof, AM radio. Where's the cigarette lighter? <laughs> and here's the thing, you kind of don't even know that what you're going through is different when you're a kid. I remember once my friend picked me up for school and they had one of those vans with the DVD players in it. And I sat down and I was like, oh man, this place... This place is really nice you got here. Uh, are you guys renting a room? Are you subletting? Can we get a place? They didn't live in their car. <laughs> they drove that to their real house. I'm at the point now where I'm not even comfortable unless there is like poverty around me, you know? Like I used to live on, I was living on Lock Street for a while and if you're not from Hamilton, Lock Street is like a really gentrified, expensive neighborhood that exists in Hamilton. And here's how you know you live in a gentrified neighborhood. There was more than one cupcake shop, you know? <laughs> there were a lot of guys with like gray hair jogging in those spandex suits. That's how you know you're living in a nice neighborhood. But if you go to a neighborhood where you see a guy running in jeans, that's a bad neighborhood. That is, you need to leave immediately because some stuff is going down. I was uh, telling a, a friend of mine recently about living in a car as a kid and was a black friend of mine. And I say that because it's relevant to the story. I don't always just <laughs> preface my friends with their racial background. I started doing it for my white friends, actually. That's what I'm going to start doing. Oh, this white friend of mine, Kevin? People would be like, yeah, everybody's white. Why would he say that? <laughs> I like that joke because it taps into deep subconscious racism that white people aren't even aware of yet. It's like, oh no, I do think everybody's white. Why do I think that? Just leave people spiraling in the crowd. So I was telling this friend of mine and I told him all about my childhood and I told him that I used to be a rapper when I was a kid. Ziploc kept it fresh. Uh, and he was like, oh man, Zach, that's really cool. You know, you're like, you're like a, you're like a real black guy. Like, I'm going to give you like an honorary black card. For a second, I was like, oh man, that's really nice. And then I thought about it, I was like, wait, are you trying to say because I had a crappy childhood growing up and I like rap music that makes me like a black person? <laughs> As a newly crowned black person, I'm very racially offended at those stereotypes, sir. <laughs> Taking away your black card, my people have been through too much. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. I, I have had some healthy ways of dealing with my childhood, but there's also been some really negative ways that I dealt with it. When I was in my late teens and my early 20s, uh, I used to drink a lot because I don't know if you've tried drinking, but it's amazing. <laughs> Super fun. But the weird thing is, considering my childhood, it was actually a really bad form of rebellion, you know? Like, if I really wanted to rebel, I should have just made, like, right choices and <laughs> done things in a proper way, gotten a job. You're like, Zach, you're ruining this family with your consistent living. I used to be a blackout drunk, which is the worst kind of drunk because you don't even remember all of the crazy things that you just did, you know? You just wake up in the morning and immediately feel shame all over your body and you have no idea why. 
You just know that you upset some vague group of people yesterday. <laughs> Sent a group text to everybody in your phone. You're like, I'm sorry for whatever it was that I did. <laughs> sure, it was horrible. <laughs> One night I got blackout drunk and I woke up in the morning and I was just covered in glitter. Which is terrifying, because you figure if you end up covered in glitter, you were a part of a significant event the night before. <laughs> I just woke up in the morning, I'm like, well, I guess I slept with David Bowie last night. That's the only... <laughs> and if you're going to sleep with David Bowie, you want to remember that. That sounds like a fun event, you know? Figure there's like a whole routine that goes on. Backup dancers out of the closet, guitar solo, glitter everywhere. Like, bravo, David Bowie. I'll be back again next week. <laughs> Joke's a lot weirder now that David Bowie's dead. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I've been doing that joke with David Bowie, and I don't know what to do about it. For a while, I was like, oh, I'll just change it. I'll pick, like, a new celebrity. And then I started doing it about Prince, and then Prince died. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, what have I done? I don't want to have this power anymore. <laughs> So here's what I've decided. I'm only going to do that joke about Donald Trump from now on. That's all I'm going to do. I, uh, I did get sober, though. Uh, I've been completely sober now for the last three years. Thanks. I have no idea how to celebrate. Water's on me, everybody. All right, let's do this. That's the thing. When you don't drink anymore, you can't get excited for things in the same way. Like, the word woo has just been taken out of my vocabulary in every way. There are no group of sober bros at a fraternity somewhere like, all right, fellas, tonight we are going to get hydrated. Let's do this. We are going to make some rational decisions. We're going to have fun tonight and take full advantage of tomorrow as well. There's no Drake song where he's popping bottles at Dasani in the club somewhere. So my favorite part about not drinking is that I never have to go to a nightclub again for the rest of my life. Thank God for that shit, right? That is... Nightclubs are just... If, here's, I've been to nightclubs sober. That's how I know they're horrible. Every time I show up, I'm like, wow, this is the weirdest episode of National Geographic that I've ever seen. Why are people doing this? Weird things happen to you. Like, sometimes I'll be at a bar and just like animal instincts of people just kick in, you know? Like, I was standing at a bar, a really crowded bar, and this guy was walking by, and we, like, bumped shoulders. And he looked at me, he's like, hey, man, you want to fight? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. I was literally just standing in a place, sir. Sorry my physical existence bothers you, but there's literally nothing I can do about it. I have to be in the physical plane. I can't cease to be and be some sort of energy form for you. I don't even... Understand that's just too esoteric of a problem to me <laughs> to even grasp. Besides, you waited in a line for a very long time to come to a crowded bar. There are empty bars everywhere that you can go to and wave your dick around or whatever kind of <laughs> plan you're having for this night is. Here's what I see every time I go to a bar. There's always this moment where there are three girls and they're on the dance floor and they've all locked eyes in just the most romantic way that I've ever seen people lock eyes. And they just are in love with each other, just as friends, you know? And they're having the greatest moment of their life, and Sally just broke up with Jeff, and they're not talking to any guys today. And this is their favorite song, Oh My God, This Is Our Moment. And always directly then, from the deepest, darkest, creepiest corner of the bar, <laughs> some dude just slowly emerges towards them. <laughs> then he stands near this group of girls and he's like, all right, I would like to sleep with any of them. <laughs> what are my plans here? I can talk to them. No, stupid. I can wait till they're done dancing with each other and try and strike up a conversation later. No, stupid again. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put my penis on one of them. <laughs> That's a real thing that's happening out there, folks. <laughs> Guys are just going up to girls and putting their penis on them. Just hoping for the best, I suppose. <laughs> I 
just want to know when is that ever going to work for somebody, you know? When is there just going to be a girl dancing in a bar somewhere? She'll be like, what is that, a penis? Finally. Just start. <laughs> Dreams do come true. <laughs> Every time it happens, just these girls just going, no! No! How dare you? And then this guy takes a big step back and he's like, all right, well, that didn't work. <laughs> what else do I got in the arsenal? Let's go for it again. All right, here we go. <laughs> guy may not be smart, but he is always persistent, that fellow. <laughs> Sometimes you end up in really shady places too when you're drinking at nightclubs and stuff. I was in a place recently and I put my drink down and somebody's like, hey man, you don't want to put a coaster over that drink so you don't get roofied. I was like, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna want to leave this bar, all right? Uh, let's stop hanging out at places where we have to protect ourselves from getting roofied. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a fun time to me. Also, that sounds like the least effective way to prevent a roofying <laughs> that I've ever heard of. People want to wear, you could just lift the coaster up, put the pill in, put the coaster back down. People think there's a bunch of like molesters around a corner somewhere, just being like, Ah, shit, coaster, nothing we can do. <laughs> so a bunch of guys in a laboratory somewhere dropping pills on top of coasters. They're impenetrable! <laughs> That's why when I go to a bar, I don't put a coaster over my drink, I put one over my butthole. <laughs> pull down my pants, they're like, shit, coaster, nothing we can do! I, I don't know if that one's going to make it the special. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, tell you guys the moment that I decided that it was time for me to stop drinking. Oh. Happened a, a couple of years ago. I uh, met this girl and she was really cool. We were hanging out and I met her at a comedy show and we were flirting a little bit. And then I realized that independently of me, another friend of mine, Patrick, was also met this girl, flirting with her, liked her a little bit. Totally cool. None of us were dating. It was totally fine. Until one day, three of us ended up at a party together. And we started doing a lot of drinking. And we did some more drinking. Then we did some more drinking. Then we started making these jokes. <laughs> like, hey, Patrick, wouldn't it be funny if me, you, and this girl... <sighs> <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I don't know. I never know how to gingerly... The unholy trinity is what I've been calling it. Uh... Devil's threesome, that's what they say on the streets. Pig roast, I think is the last. Those are just the technical terms, folks. I don't know what to do about it, all right? It's my favorite part of the show when I do this. That's the takeaway that I want. I just want someone to be wearing a t-shirt of mine and just another person sees them across the street and it's like this. <laughs> People are like, yeah, I like Zach too. <laughs> so here's the thing. We started making these jokes and at first they were just like silly, funny jokes. And then they started getting more logistical. <laughs> Like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if the three of us went to your apartment in 25 minutes? I'll start on this side, you start on that side. I know, I'm sorry. You think describing it is gross? We did it. And now I've just invited a room full of strangers to listen to me tell stories about threesomes in my living room. We did it, and uh, I'm going to be honest with you, not a very fun experience. That was not, you want to know what ruins the intimacy of sex? When you look up and see your best friend also having sex with the girl you're having sex with. You're like, oh, him too? Hopefully I'm better. That's all you've got in that moment. One of the weirdest parts was after we all, like, did that together, we all slept in the same bed, like the three of us spooned with each other. 
I know, I don't know what, somebody should have left. <laughs> I remember at one point I was like sitting there and I went to go and like caress her hand because obviously you're trying to keep the romance up in this situation. <laughs> I start caressing her hand, I'm like, man, this chick's got some big hands. They're a little hairy too. Oh no, Patrick! <laughs> It was the most romantic moment Patrick and I ever had. <laughs> Here's the actual weirdest part of the whole situation. It's Patrick and this girl dated for a year after that. <laughs> so I guess he was better. I lost, I didn't. <laughs> he took home the trophy. So what happened was after that, at some point, three of us were standing out on the porch. We were all naked. I was smoking a cigarette. And I thought to myself, you know what, maybe it's time for me to make some changes. <laughs> I think I made some wrong decisions somewhere. So I did, I made all these changes, and I got sober, I stopped doing all that stuff. But I also learned a valuable lesson during that time. Because to be honest with you guys, when I was doing all that drinking and partying, I wasn't a very good person. I didn't care about other people, and I wasn't kind, and I wasn't nice, and I was doing things that I couldn't stand behind, and I really didn't like myself. But as I got sober and I started to work through this situation, I ended up going out and asking people for forgiveness, the people that I hurt. And they started to give me this forgiveness. And it was a really freeing, beautiful thing. And it made me think of somebody. It made me think of my mom. And at this point, I, I hadn't spoken to my mom in about seven years. And I had a lot of anger and hate and resentment build up towards her. And I didn't know what to do with it. But I realized as I was giving this forgiveness that that was something that I should give to her too. And I realized that the things that she was doing when I was a kid, they weren't out of hate towards me. It was just a bad situation that she got caught up into, which is the same thing that happened to me. So on Boxing Day two years ago, I called my mom for the first time in seven years, and I forgave her, and I told her that I loved her. And it was one of the most freeing, beautiful experiences that I've ever had. And I don't know if any of you guys, this story brings somebody up to you in your mind who maybe you haven't forgiven, who you have hate and resentment towards. And I can't urge you enough if you have somebody like that to try your best to forgive them because it's the most beautiful thing you can do for the both of you. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a relationship with them, but you should honestly and truthfully forgive them. And now we found ourselves at uh, a tough point where <sighs> it's very hard for me to transition back into jokes. <laughs> Like, hey everybody, forgive the people that you hate. What's the deal with Facebook, am I right? <laughs> Silly observations. But uh, we're gonna do it, we're gonna go back into jokes. Uh, we'll keep it light. Uh, I believe in God. <laughs> Just got an appropriate groan from the audience. But like, don't bring God into this, fella. We liked this show. I, uh, spirituality played a big role in helping me do all this stuff. I do believe in God. I'm actually a Christian. Here's an interesting thing that I found out about Christianity. Telling a room full of people you're a Christian is a great way to make a lot of people very uncomfortable. <laughs> I've like traveled all across the country and I've told jokes about like murder and racism and genocide and people are like, totally cool, man. And then I'm like, I love Jesus. And people are like, I don't think so, pal. <laughs> We gotta draw the line somewhere. We're leaving, Diane. This young man and his earnest love of Christ. Literally every time I do it, I can feel people's buttholes tightening up. Every single time. I have to like bring an inhaler with me to shows. But it's okay, you can loosen all of your buttholes. There's no altar call at the end of this. I don't have pamphlets to hand out. I don't care what religion you are. So it'll be fine. And I understand why people aren't comfortable with Christianity because there are a lot of really weird Christians out there. Like, have you ever seen that CNN split screen debate that they do? Where on one side, they'll have like the atheist guy and he's got like a tweed jacket and four PhDs on the wall. Literally the smartest man in the entire world. <laughs> then they cut to the other side and it's just a field in the middle of Arkansas somewhere. <laughs> Reverend Jebediah pops up on the screen. He's chewing tobacco in the background. Just eight dudes in front of a barn like this. <laughs> you get him, Jebediah, you let him know. 
Then the thing comes up, it's like, Reverend Jebediah doesn't believe in gay marriage. It's like, Reverend Jebediah doesn't believe in toasters, all right? So, <laughs> let's not take our cultural cues from Jebediah, all right? A bunch of people in cities everywhere that you can talk to. That's the thing, a lot of times when you tell people that you're a Christian, what they hear you say is, I hate gay people. Which is not a thing that you have to do, actually. You don't have to... There was no part on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was like, love your neighbor, unless they're a queer. That makes me uncomfortable, <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> Jesus spent all his time with lepers and prostitutes and tax collectors. Think of a couple of ladies who were in love with one another came up to him. Like, hi, Jesus, uh, we're thinking about committing our lives together in love, adopting an orphan, otherwise be uncared for. What do you think about that? You think Jesus is going to be like, get away from me, you sinners! With your love and acceptance of others? There's one thing you know about me, Jesus. It's that I hate love. That's my platform. See those guys with like the, God hates bag signs. It's like, no, he doesn't. You do. You made the sign, motherfucker. <laughs> is clearly your handwriting. <laughs> Here's the thing, you can't hate people as a Christian. You can only hate people as an asshole. That's the only way. I don't know, I don't have all the answers. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know anything. I'm an idiot, I want you to know that. I want you to know deep down that I don't know anything, but here's my hypothesis, this is what I think. I don't think that God came to earth as a man, lived a whole life, taught people about love and forgiveness, acceptance of others, died on a cross, and resurrected. I don't think God did all of that to tell us not to stick it in each other's poopers, all right? I think, <laughs> I think there's a chance the message might be a little bigger than that. I think <laughs> you might be missing something if you think that's what it is. If you read the whole Bible and close it at the end and are like, well, I guess I hate gay people. <laughs> that doesn't make you a good Christian. That makes you a bad reader. <laughs> Ridiculous. I, uh, I'll tell you guys uh, how I first experience that I had with God and, and how I sort of came to terms with that. Uh, I used to practice this style of yoga called Ashtanga Yoga. And the way that Ashtanga works is you show up to this class and there's this list of poses that you run through. There was this one pose that I was working on and it's called Supta Karmasana. And the way that Supta Karmasana works is like, you, you fold yourself up into a pretzel and then you, you like, you, you put your legs behind your head. It's the legs behind your head pose. And I don't know if you've ever tried to put your legs behind your head, but it is very difficult. That is not an easy challenge. And here's the thing, I convinced myself that like, if I can't, put my legs behind my head, I'm always gonna be a bad guy, which is a silly thing to convince yourself of. It's not true at all, there's no logic behind that. A lot of really good people in the history of time never put their legs behind their head. <laughs> like there was no, like Martin Luther King would never put his legs behind his head, it never happened. Pretty great guy, his legs stationary at all times. So I'm in this yoga class and I'm trying to put my legs behind my head and I can't put my legs behind my head. And then at some point I ask my yoga teacher, I'm like, hey, yoga teacher, why can't I put my legs behind my head? And she's like, oh, it's because you're holding anger in your hamstrings. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not. That's not real. That, that's not... <laughs> you just made that up. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You can't hold anger in your... Now I'm holding anger in my whole body at how dumb that thing you just said was. <laughs> and then at some point I just stopped and I look around at this yoga class and I see all these people trying all of these like hard moves and they can't do them and I just start laughing to myself. And I realize that me putting my legs behind my head has nothing to do with me being like loved or holy or connected to the universe or whatever it was that I was trying to do. Here's the thing, there's no sect of heaven for people with loose hamstrings, you know? It's not, I realized that whatever kind of thing that I was working for was just like inherent in my being and there was nothing that I could do about it. And I realized that like whatever, there's nothing you can work for because you'll never achieve the thing. There's just this unconditional love that exists for all of us, whether we're Christian or Muslim or Jewish or atheist or whatever. And there's nothing we can do about it, which is good because if we could fuck it up, we all would. And 
<laughs> and now, once again, find ourselves in a situation where it's very hard for me to transition back into jokes. There's a source of love that has unconditional love for all of us, for all of mankind, for eternity. What's the deal with Twitter, everybody? Uh, no, I, uh, I'm going to wrap the show up. Uh, we're going we're gonna to tie it up. Have you guys had a fun time so far? Have you guys liked the show? Phew, that would have been awkward if you said no. Uh, all right, so I was thinking about you know, how to end the show. How do I tie all of this stuff together? Very weird story. You know, living in a car when you're a kid, and Jesus, and then that thing, and <laughs> all of it is very strange. So I was thinking about, I was riding my bicycle, and I'm like, okay, how do I like, end this show? How do I put all this together? And I'm riding my bike, which is great, because I don't have to take the bus, right? You know? I don't, I, I, you know, I gave the bus a bad rap earlier, I think. It's, the bus is not as bad as I made it out to be. Sometimes you have, like, beautiful moments around the bus, you know? One time I was going to take the bus, and there was this man in front of me, and he saw a lady that he knew off in the distance, and he yelled at her. He's like, hi, Colleen, how's it going? And this Colleen lady yelled back at him. She's like, my mother died on Sunday. <laughs> That was a little abrupt, Colleen, all right? In the future, you're gonna to wanna to ease into that conversation. Get a few openers before you jump in the my mother just died thing. The best part of this thing was this guy's response to it. He just looked at her and he's like, this is how I know this guy's lived a lot of life. Looks at her, he's like, all right, you have a nice day. And he just got on the bus and he left. Just no thank you to that right out of his life. It was amazing. If I could have any superpower, that's gonna be just to no thank you things, just, sorry to tell you, Mr. McDonald, but uh, you've got cancer. No thank you, and just on a bus, and I go, and <laughs> guy's like, well, I guess he doesn't, throws the chart in the garbage. <laughs> so, I'm thinking about how do I end this show, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm riding my bike, and I'm riding my bike, and then all of a sudden, just like, out of nowhere, just wham, it hits me. And when I say wham, it hits me, I don't so much mean the idea for how to end the show hits me, as much as I mean that an SUV hits me. <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking, you're like, Zach, you've had a pretty crappy life up to this point. Surely you're not telling me that you're gonna end this story with you getting hit by an SUV. You must mean some sort of metaphorical SUV of ideas. No, not at all, that's not at all what I mean. I mean a literal SUV of steel and gasoline hit me and I flew 62 feet across the intersection, which is the world record for long jump, by the way, so I got that going for me. Also, halfway through, my legs went behind my head. I was like, yes, I did it! I 100% should have died. Uh, I didn't die, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. That would have been a great ending to the show, though, I think. If it was, how was the show on Saturday? Oh, it was really good. Turns out the guy was dead the whole time. <laughs> whole Sixth Sense sort of vibe. <laughs> Zach McDonald, Tales from the Afterlife. What's the deal with infinity? <laughs> Isn't it funny how time isn't linear? <laughs> <laughs> Only a certain kind of person laughs at that joke. Uh, so I got hit by this car, and I woke up, and I was in an ambulance. And the first thing I did was I looked up at the paramedic guy, and I was like, hey, man, am I going to die? Which was a pertinent question for me at that point. And he avoided answering. <laughs> that was a terrifying response. I was looking for a strong no on that one, sir, actually. And some people were like, oh, he was trying to protect himself, like, in case something happened. And it's like, protect himself from who? Who was I going to tell if I died? <laughs> Here's what happened though, my body got all beaten and broken down and I was bruised and battered and I didn't really know what to make with this and I was feeling like physically and emotionally and just spiritually bankrupt and I didn't know what to do. And around this time, I had uh, just started going to this church in Hamilton and it was around Easter Sunday and I was going to the Easter Sunday service and I recognized that I, I didn't really feel anything when I went to this place on Sundays. It was kind of just a thing that I did and I, I didn't really know how I connected with it and it didn't feel tangible to me, but I decided to go anyways on this Sunday. And uh, this service, we were talking about uh, the resurrection of Jesus, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I 
specifically during this time, uh, he focused on the, the part that when Jesus comes back in the story of resurrection, he still has all of the scars on his body from crucifixion. And for some reason, this really hit me in this situation. And I started crying in the middle of the service, which it was Easter Sunday. That's the corniest church service to cry in, by the way. I was like crying a little bit because it was beautiful and a little bit because of like how horrible of a cliche that I was in this moment. <laughs> but what I realized was that I had spent all this time and I like become this new person and I got sober and I was making all these right choices and I found all of this new stuff, but I still had all of these stories that I told today. And I still had all of this struggle going on in my life. And I didn't know where that fit into this new person that I was. I didn't know what to make sense of all of those things. And then I realized through this story that all of your struggles and all of your heartaches are real and they're a part of your story and they're tangible and they're just as holy and sacred as the fact that you've, that you've become this new person. And it made me think about how as human beings, when we're born, there's sort of only this one guarantee that we get and that it's, we're all going to die someday. And that is a very sad thing. But for some reason, all of us in the face of that, uh, we decide to keep hanging out with each other. And we decide to keep coming to comedy shows and singing songs together and eating food together. And we decide to still have hope and to try and make the world a better place. And to me, that's just the most beautiful thing in the world. Because I think that considering the realities of what life is, we should, no, nobody should want to do any of this. Why continue? You, know, you, you ever just wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't know, I don't want to, don't want to do this. <laughs> but for some reason, we have those days and we keep moving on. And I realize that if we, in the face of death, can keep pointing ourselves towards hope and towards being together and towards the reconciliation of all races and religions and different sexual orientations that I think we can make a change and I think we can find hope and I think we can find uh, transformation in that and I think we can take all of our sad stories and turn them into nice stories, into funny stories, into beautiful stories. And just like I did today, I took all these sad stories and formed them into the happiest story I know. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. My name is Zach McDonald. Have a good night.